Welcome to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, where we discuss all things Bible and theology. Because it matters, what you really believe determines how you really behave. Now, here is your host, Associate Professor of Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary and Professor of Bible and Theology for the National Theological College and Graduate School, Dr. Paul Weaver. It is great to have Dr. Elliot Johnson back in the podcast studio today. Last week, we had a conversation about his life story. We learned about his life commitment to the study and teaching of God's inspired and inerrant word. And in today's podcast, we're going to define and describe dispensationalism, a subject that Dallas Theological Seminary is famous for, and one that is very important as it relates to understanding the scriptures in general and the grand narrative of scripture or the story of scripture in particular. Dr. Elliot Johnson is my guest and subject material expert. Dr. Johnson earned a Bachelor of Science degree from Northwestern University. He earned a Master of Theology from Dallas Theological Seminary and a Doctor of Theology also from Dallas Theological Seminary. He is the founder of the Asian Theological Seminary in the Philippines and has taught at Dallas Theological Seminary for 47 years prior to his retirement in 2019. Dr. Johnson has written extensively in the field of hermeneutics, including a book he has authored entitled Expository Hermeneutics. Dr. Johnson, welcome back to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast. Thank you, Paul. I I really appreciate Paul's offer to give me an opportunity to both express thanks for what the Lord has done over a long period of time, faithfulness, and that was last week, but also the subject of dispensationalism, which is both debated and called a friend in other quarters. So I hope we get some feedback, questions, and perhaps we can discuss those questions on a subsequent time together. Yes. So if, as you're listening to this podcast, you do have questions about anything mentioned or maybe in your own personal reading, or you'd like to have those answered, please send those to me at P for Paul, P Weaver at DTS.edu. That's P for Paul, P Weaver at DTS.edu. And we'd love to answer those on a future podcast and have Dr. Johnson back for that. Well, Dr. Johnson, before we begin defining and describing the specifics of what dispensationalism is, could you give us an understanding of what it seeks to do? Yeah, let me start by saying I was not introduced to dispensationalism until really I got to Dallas Seminary. I grew up, as I mentioned, in a church in Chicago that was not particularly oriented toward a dispensational teaching. It was a Baptist church. They preached the word, but were not of that orientation. Even when I went to Moody Bible Institute, John Martin was not particularly attracted by dispensationalists. So I didn't come with any encouragement that that was what I needed. But my real interest and bent as a student is to see how a big picture of the Bible fits together. And that was when Dr. Ryrie had finished writing his first book. And after he wrote this second book, which I'm going to quote in a moment. first book was called Dispensationalism Today. Today. Yeah, and that was really... uh, The initial apologetic, we'll talk more about that role that it had. This one has been written after progressive dispensationalism came on the scene. I was at Dallas during that time as a faculty member, so was very much involved in the characters that were involved. And I felt in describing what to expect might be found most clearly from the end of the book, Dr. Ryerian calls a plea, okay. to plead to those who may not know what dispensationalism is, to see its benefits. And here's what he said. The basic distinctions, classic or normative dispensationalism, as explained in this book, though sometimes challenged or changed, remain the bedrock teaching of the dispensational approach to understanding the Bible. So it's really a, a way of reading the Bible as a whole. Now the last sentence. And we believe the use of normative dispensational principles That's we're going to be talking about those principles at some length. To be the best help one can use to interpret the Bible correctly and consistently. Now, it's that last section which actually came my experience as well. Mm. What I was studying in Bible exposition, what I was studying in Greek exegesis, found a greater harmony than I saw in any other possible way of uniting the pieces. So, That's in part what we're going to be talking about. 
So would you say it's our understanding of human history as, as it unfolds in the Bible? Would that be fair? That would be fair, but particularly from God's point of view. Right. We've had faculty in our department in Dallas telling the story of the Bible. I think God is the central character of the Bible, God the Father. Yes. God the Son is the implementer of that, of his plan, but it is God the Father that is at the heart and center right. of what is happening in history. Dr. Ryu will say in his book that one of the contributions is giving you a philosophy of history, a way of looking at history. Now, it's a biblical way of looking at history, right. so it doesn't give explanations necessarily to the emergence of secular theories right. like evolution but it does give you a way of seeing how God has been working in history, beginning from creation Uh and anticipating the climax of history. Well, I just want to go back and encourage our listeners. We did actually, as we're recording this, we're releasing these four weeks of a grand narrative of scripture with Dr. Scott Keene, who takes the same perspective as you do, and I do as well, that we need to see it from God's perspective. And as far as the story, as it unfolds in beginning Genesis 1, 26, 28, seeing that fully realized in Revelation 20, 21 in the kingdom, but then going into all of eternity. So it's yes. that's key. The scripture is a unified book, yes. right? 66 individual books, but it's one story. And so I encourage you, if you haven't already listened to that podcast series, it's a great one with Dr. Scott Keene, who is with Ethnos 360, academic dean of their Bible Institute, and is teaching as an adjunct here with us. Well, Dr. Johnson, as you know, there is arguably no school, church, or parachurch organization, church history, that has done more, this is my opinion, but maybe you would agree or disagree, has done more for our understanding and development of dispensationalism than Dallas Theological Seminary. Would you please explain? Well, I certainly would agree with that. However, I think the place where dispensationalism has been most at home is in the church. It has not been well received by scholars who desire to see their own point of view introduced into the scheme. Only those who are willing to accept what the Bible is saying are really willing to give the view of dispensationalism a fair hearing. And I think that happens in the church. Uh Uh-huh. However, grassroots. That's right. That's right. I think it has the greatest benefit in helping people in the church understanding the Bible as a whole. Now, on the other side, certainly the seminary has given more attention to that, particularly in the days of Chafer and then followed by Walverd, Pentecost, and Ryrie. More recently, we've had other faculty involved in the discussion. I was not at Dallas when Dr. Chafer was, so I never had that privilege. And yet he attempted to write a eight-volume theology that is in a systematic discussion of dispensationalism. Dr. Walverd rewrote that in a two-volume a work to give it more of our temporary audience access to the ideas that he developed. And that certainly gives a foundation. At the same time that he was doing that, Ryrie was writing in the area a biblical theology. He was also writing the dispensational book, Dispensationalism Today and Dispensationalism. Pentecost was, as an expositor, was developing the, uh, the thought of the text from beginning to end as an expositor. And I've attempted to do the same. It's been published now about five years. It's called A Dispensational Biblical Theology, and it attempts to tell what is happening in Scripture, God's point of view. Mm -hmm. We'll discuss the point of view that he takes and how he develops that as we begin to answer these questions. But I certainly appreciated the opportunity to spend time with these individuals, and particularly Pentecost. Yeah, then of course, Pentecost's book, Things to Come. Classic. Yes, and it certainly brings a dispensational perspective yes. to all those eschatological passages of Scripture. And That's right. As I interviewed Dr. Ryrie and wrote on his life and ministry, he wrote Dispensationalism Today by encouragement of Frank Gabeline because the new Schofield Study Bible is coming out. And it was to complement that. And, and it's interesting that he was encouraged to write that at the same time as the Schofield, New Schofield was being revised. And yeah. actually, there was a hang up in the New Schofield and Ryrie's book, Dispensationalism Today, was released earlier. But anyhow, those two things worked well together to really popularize dispensationalism in addition to the 
yeah. other scholars here at Dallas Seminary. Many of the Bible colleges like Moody Bible Institute and Cedarville and Grace College and Baptist Bible College, a lot of those were heavily influenced by Dallas Seminary graduates that either started those schools or became presidents and theologians in those schools and That's many right. others around the United States. It, the tra it's transitioning now that they want to go beyond the Bible for degrees and get a profession in, but that really is where these schools began. Do you know the Bible? And Dallas was a source for the clearest development of what the Bible was. I'm always interested in studying American church history and the development of things, and I think the normal development was a Bible institute, then became, you know, one or two-year Bible institute, then became an associate's degree, then became four-year bachelor's degree, then a lot of them became schools with liberal arts programs. And so that's kind of the history, you know, Word of Life Bible Institute's one of those that said, no, we're going to stay in this lane, but most Bible Institutes have transitioned, They've transitioned. into colleges that's and universities. Right. One other thing you mentioned I'd like to touch on, but the grassroots level, that it seems to be, you know, a person with the Bible in their hands, as you mentioned, dispensationalism has been very influential in local churches and not always in the academia, but because if you come with a normal, plain, simple reading of Scripture, doesn't it lead you to come to dispensationalism, certainly agree whether you know the term or not? Yeah, I would certainly agree with that. And if you come with a desire, well, how does this all fit together? Yeah. It's so many details, yeah. so many individual stories that don't seem to have relationship. And dispensationalists, whether it was Darby at the outset or Schofield more recently, taught the church and taught in that fashion. I still read Darby's material uh -huh. because it is a fresh exposition of the text. And whether you agree with him or not, you at least are able to interact with that fresh point of view. He was a helpful pioneer in this area. Uh -huh. Well, as you alluded to, and you've read already from, Charles Ryrie wrote a book entitled Dispensationalism Today. It was revised and is today simply called Dispensationalism. Please discuss the significance of that book to even our discussion today. Well, the book that I tried to write was more an exposition of the teaching of Scripture from beginning to end. What Dr. Ryrie is providing is an apologetic, a defense. And Paul was right in quoting Frank Gabeline. It's rather interesting how these two men thought Frank Gabeline was one of the mentors of Dr. Ryrie. So let me just read a little bit about what he had to say in his foreword. The system of Bible interpretation, known as dispensationalism, has in recent years been subjected to much opposition. Growing literature of books and articles has vigorously attacked it. Some have called dispensational heresy and have classified it among the cults. Others have identified it with modernism. Not all, but much of the criticism has come from evangelical writers themselves. Thus far, dispensationalists have done little to answer this criticism. Though they have been writing extensively, their work has not been apologetic or defending what positions it's taken, but rather expository, which is what I've attempted to do, particularly in the prophetic portions of Scripture. And that's what Dr. Pentecost did in Things to Come. That certainly has been an emphasis that Dallas has taken. Future thing, eschatology, end time, is not something that most theologians want to give much time to. If you're writing about history, you have the events that took place that can be used to try to validate or verify what you're saying. Eschatology doesn't have that. You rest on God has spoken right. and try to understand what he's saying. So Dr. Ryrie's book is the first book-length contemporary apologetic for dispensationalism to be written by a recognized scholar, and that actually is the case. And yet there's an interesting difference in the perspectives of the two men. This was written in 1965. Prior to his first book, Dr. Ryrie chose to include it in his second book as well. Mm -hmm. And the last paragraph will give you an interesting perspective, and I'll try to talk about the two. You're still reading Frank Gabeline's introduction. I'm forward. still reading his introduction. That's correct. As one for whom dispensationalism is not a theology, but rather a method of interpretation, helpful in grasping the progress of revelation in the Bible, I do not find myself in agreement with every aspect of Dr. Ryrie's presentation. Yet, I believe that this book 
is mandatory reading for those who have attacked dispensationalism and for all who would understand what it really is as a reasonable and scholarly defense or apologetic for dispensationalism it cannot be ignored dr ryari is laying out the result of reading the bible in a straightforward fashion right reading it if you please from what god intends from what the human multiple human authors intend over the generations. And the product is a series of doctrines or teachings which enable it to be called a theology. Those teachings themselves, when applied to the process of interpretation or used in the process of it, become a hermeneutic. And interestingly, Gabeline identified what became the forefront of a form of dispensationalism developed here at Dallas called progressive dispensation. Dr. Bach and I taught courses for our doctoral students during this whole discussion. So his word to me was that progressive should not be understood in the way it's being used in politics today. Right. So I think there is a touch of that present. It is that which has advanced. He says it's to relate to progressive revelation. Interestingly, Gabeline said that was the same thing. He said it helps you understand how progressive revelation ought to have stood. And in that sense, it lays out principle. Progressive revelation has a goal, the glory of God. So revelation has a means of speaking and being understood. That's where literal comes. Progressive revelation is addressed to two audiences, addressed to Israel, and yet it's addressed to the church. And yet Paul will say in Second Timothy, all scripture, which at his time was the Old Testament, right. is given by inspiration of God. So you both read, taught by the Old Testament, and apply what that message is, the correction of your life. So it is a theology, but it also will help you in reading the New Testament and reading the Bible itself. How does the New Testament interpret the Old Testament? That's really the core of this yes, whole subject, isn't that it? It is. We're attempting to do what the New Testament apostles, we think that's possible. And that's what dispensationalism provides. We are going to discuss what Ryrie has labeled the three sine qua non, and sine qua non is Latin for literally without which not, or more simply put, essentials. We're going to discuss what Ryrie says are the three things that without which not, or without which you are not a dispensationalist, in his estimation, or the three definitive characteristics of dispensationalism. The first of the sine qua non involves principles of hermeneutics we've already alluded to, specifically the literal interpretation of scripture. We might also use interchangeably terms like normal or plain interpretation because it doesn't preclude symbols and figures of speech, right? Uh, please explain this, this sine qua non. Let me first talk to you about how the sine qua non came into existence. That'd be great. Dr. Ryrie was involved in that, and he and Dr. Walvoord had gathered together with the faculty. Each fall, the faculty gathers for a time as a faculty where they pray together, where they discuss ideas. And one of the questions that had been unanswered was, what is it that defines the theology of Dallas Seminary or the identity of what Dallas Seminary is? So Dr. Ryrie, not as a result of research, not as a result of any kind of academic pursuit, laid out for the faculty and Dr. Walver what he considered to be those essential. And Dr. Walvert appreciated it so much that he wanted Briary to write it out and to lay it out. So he's laid it out both in his Dispensationalism Today and he's laid it out in his current book, Dispensationalism. The principal hermeneutic or guide for reading the Bible, he would call literal. And I think this was interesting. When we were in the Council of Biblical Inerrancy, no matter what version of a biblical theology or a summary of the story of the Bible the various schools took, they all wanted to take literal interpretation. Okay. They all wanted to call themselves literalists. Huh. Now, I think this is really originates historically from the allegorical sense that was developed at Alexandria. Right. 
as opposed to the literal sense that was developed at Antioch. Popularized by Origen and Augustine, especially Yeah, that's Augustine. right. They were the popularizers of the allegory, and the faculty at Antioch are not quite as well known, but if you read their writings, they try to take the Bible at face value. And if you allow normal to be the author's intended meaning, not just that, but as he's expressed it in the text, you have to deal both with the reading of the text in light of what the divine author is intending to say. I had some very interesting discussions with Norman Geisler while I was originally writing the text on expository hermeneutics. Norm Geisler was critical of what I was saying until I brought the two together. It's the divine author's intended meaning through the expressed writing of the biblical text. Once I had said that, we became great friends. He basically concurred with what I was saying. What we're concerned about, John chapter 11 and verse 30, or 50 rather, Caiaphas is speaking. This is after the resurrection that Jesus had called Lazarus to life, and he had become extremely popular. It was becoming clear to him that everyone was going to follow him. So you have in John chapter 11, verse 50, following words. The interesting feature is that you have the same words expressing two meanings. You have Caiaphas's intended meaning, and you have God's intended meaning. So with that background, let me try to give you verse 50 and read it for you. It begins actually in the last line of verse 49. You knew nothing at all, nor do you consider that it, and here's the words, that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Now those same words have a opposite meaning in God's sense. So David goes on to develop that, what it means from God's authoring those words and what it means from Caiaphas' authoring those words. So literal does not mean simply using the text. You have to use the text, but it is an author that is speaking. And of course, God is speaking of his desire that Christ bear the sin of the world, that no one should perish. He is speaking in terms of a spiritual point of view. And Caiaphas is speaking in terms of a political point of view, yeah. that they may stay in a power and that the nation may continue to exist as they did, you know, while Caiaphas was in power. So I think it's clear that what he means by literal is God's intended me as it's expressed by the prophet or by the apostle. That's great. Authorial intent, again, as we talked about yeah. in the last podcast. That's right. That's interesting to me that you say that everyone and wanted that term literal, because now we Sometimes dispensationalists get made fun of for the term yeah, literal. That's right, but not in the 1980s. <laughs> they all wanted to be known for taking the Bible seriously. Yeah. I mean, whatever literal means, it has certain connotations right. which people have associated with then. They all, it also has connotations today, yeah. which are not quite as popular. So, again, when we talk about literal or normal or plain, we're saying God's communicating. So we're looking for authorial intent. And the big A author and little a author use different genres by which to communicate that. And I think Hirsch uses the word intrinsic genre, right? Yeah, that yeah. not imposing some exterior That's understanding right. on the text, but taking the text and saying, okay. Light of what it's being. Yeah. Right. So we want to find out what the original author's intention to the original recipients, which includes using yes. figures of speech and yeah. symbols. Yeah, the way that's... But literal reference to those symbols. That's right. Now, the way it's been used by the Catholic Church, I think I understand it's changed now. They would call the divine author, meaning sensus plenior, or fuller sense. So God expanded them. What I would say is, using the same Latin language, the sensus plenus, full sense. Huh. So that this was the paper I wrote at the Council of Biblical Inerrancy. Okay. So if you take... Isaiah 7, 14, virgin shall conceive and bear a son. If you take it as a prophecy of Mary at the time, we don't know if Isaiah knew the name of this virgin. We don't know that Isaiah knew the time of this virgin. But when the angel spoke to both Mary and Joseph, as recorded in Matthew, God knew right. who this virgin was. So God's understanding was a full or complete understanding of the meaning. The human author may not have that full understanding. And it was Walt Kaiser that was making the case. 
that the human author understood everything that the divine author meant. He's and a good it, friend of yours. That's that's a dear friend of mine. And we became real friends. Yeah. He is almost a dispensationalist. <laughs> but uh, if he's ever listening to this, I know I'm going to hear. <laughs> but uh, he's a dear friend of many of us who are dispensational. Mm. All right. So that's the first sine qua non that Ryrie articulates. And it's very interesting that it came out of a, a faculty retreat or yeah. of some sort. Very informal meeting, but being expressed by those that were doing it. Uh -huh. You know, they were they were actually teaching those, and they were able to reflect on what they were doing, mm -hmm. to make those distinctions. Now, as I said, at the time of the Council on Biblical Inerrancy, everyone wanted to be literalists. But now the other two, not everyone necessarily wants to. Right. And what becomes important is we're not changing what the original author communicated, the original recipients. New Testament revelation doesn't change or no, it doesn't. what Abraham understood in That's Genesis right. 12 or Genesis 15. It may give us more revelation, more clarity. Well, full well, revelation full. of what, what was involved. Right. And did Abraham know that the promised descendant that was going to come to his family, Jesus Christ? And yet, based on what the Old Testament says, there is no question that that's in the progress of Revelation, mm -hmm. who is identified as the one spoken of as through your seed, right. all nations shall be blessed. So as a traditional, Ryrie used the term classical or traditional or normative, these are different terms that we use. I don't care for the term revised because the implication is we've changed from, I think that's not a title we use of ourselves typically, but one given to us by others. But I use the term traditional or classical. We're saying that you can't change what Abraham understood it to mean. That's right. I'm saying the original sense had its identity or self-identity it also has a boundary. Yeah. It means this. Right. It doesn't mean that. Right. So Ishmael was not the descendant God intended. Right. It was Isaac who was the first in a line of descendants from whom Jesus will be born. And that really brings us to the second scene going on, right? Because <laughs> this is really what, where it impacts the issue of Israel and the church. And so Ryrie's second scene going on, or essentials, of dispensationalism. It's the distinction between the church and Israel. Please That's explain. Right. It's important that we are not Israel. Right. So what was promised to Israel? In other words, we're not replacing mm -hmm. Israel in order to fulfill what God had not finished with Israel. God is going to finish with Israel what he says he's going to do with Israel. The church is not introduced until Matthew 16. Right. We're already into Christ's life. He is the one who is going to build the church. We also have an agenda that we are responsible. It's not Israel's responsibility, though there may be overlap. Mm -hmm. In other words, Peter will call us a nation, a people of God. Nation will be used figured or figure of speech. People of God could be used literally. We are both people of God at a different time in history. We are called to be a part of the Old Testament. They were called to be a part of a theocratic nation. Mm -hmm. We're called to be a part of Christ's body. Mm -hmm. So there is some things in common, but there also are things that are distinct. So the opposing view to dispensationalism, the opposite would be covenant theology. Why do we not hold to covenant theology as it relates to Israel and the church? They see the blessings made to Abraham, Genesis 12, promise unconditional covenant in Genesis 15. They see that taken on by the church. How yes. do we, how would you respond? God doesn't change his mind along the way since he can't do it through Israel because of their disobedience. Yeah. He'll do it through the church. No, yeah. he'll do it through Israel and work in spite of their disobedience. Right. Whereas covenant theology says in that Israel, way, Israel is the... You know, handing off the ball or yeah. something, replacement, whatever, some kind of an exchange where Israel doesn't accomplish. So sometimes we hear terms like, well, they'll talk about Israel being the Old Testament church yeah. or yeah. the church being the New Testament Israel. And that's not, no. in our estimation... Well, if you take Matthew 16, where Christ says, I will build my church, then there can't be a church existed in the Old Testament. Good. Now, the occupation of the land by an unbelieving people is yet a very remarkable feature, which those whose Israel has been set aside have a hard time answering. 1948, Yes, Israel in the land again. And 1967. And what's happening today? It's amazing. 
So we do believe that God will be faithful and, and to his accomplish covenant. what he said he was going to do with Israel, as well as accomplishing what he said he's going to do with the church. Well, our time is up for today's Bible and Theology Matters podcast. I hope you'll join us again next week as Dr. Elliot Johnson returns to the podcast studio, and we will discuss third and probably the most debated of Ryrie's sine qua non, the unifying theme of Scripture, glory of God. We'll also discuss some other nuances of Dr. Elliot Johnson's views regarding dispensationalism. And if you're enjoying this podcast, you may also enjoy the Faith Affirming Findings video podcast. You can find that on our YouTube channel, Bible and Theology Matters, where we discuss various finds from the field of biblical archaeology that will affirm your faith in the historicity of Scripture. My son has a message for you. But until next time, never forget Bible and Theology Matters. Because what you believe determines how you behave. Bible and Theology Matters podcast is a listener-supported podcast devoted to helping Christians grow in their knowledge of the Word of God and in their relationship to the God of the Word. To learn how you can partner with the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, visit us at BibleAndTheologyMatters.com. That's Bible, A-N-D, theologymatters.com.